today we will go one step further in uh, what I explained uh, yesterday. So we had, uh, we had a graph, and we defined this adjacency operator on the little L2 of, of the vertices of the graph. And um, from that, we define for any vector uh, a spectral measure, and uh, which uh, which uh, whose moments encode the number of closed walks. And uh, we have seen that when the graph was uh, at some uh, stationarity or some, well, was whether finite or was a graph, of, was a vertex transitive graph or was a unimodular graph, uh, we could, uh, we had uh, this uh, spectral measure, the expected spectral measure, uh, which I call it, the so average spectral measure, uh, is a nice object, which morally only depends on the eigenvalues and not on the uh, eigenvectors of uh, the operator, the adjacency operator A. Okay, now today I want to study the um, the, the, decompo the, the Lebesgue decomposition of uh, these two measures. So either the, the random measure uh, or the measure uh, mu rho, which is averaged. Okay, so, I, so if A, assume that A, uh, the, the, the degree is uniformly bounded, for simplicity. Uh, then my operator is bounded, and uh, you can. There is an orthogonal decomposition of uh, of uh, of L two. Okay, where, uh, for example, uh, H HSC is a set of uh, vector of psi in L two of V such that uh, uh, mu G psi is purely uh, semi uh, singular continuous, okay? And for example, this when you take uh, our vector uh, E naught, uh, <coughs> if you look at the, so for example, the singular continuous part of that, this is the norm of the orthogonal, this is the projection, the norm of the orthogonal projection of E naught on this uh, uh, vector space. Okay. Similarly, if uh, if uh, so, you remember this uh, resolution of the identity uh, mu g e naught of uh, a singleton lambda uh, will be because here you can further decompose among uh, among um, uh, vectors with. Uh, 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 vectors with, uh, for which mu g of psi is uh, a Dirac mass at some somewhere, and mu g of e naught of lambda will be the, I think this was my notation, e lambda of e naught squared, which is the orthogonal projection on the, on, uh, this is the orthogonal projection on uh, uh, the vector space of lambda eigenvectors. Okay. So, uh, Justin, this afternoon will uh, uh, tell you a lot about uh, atoms uh, in uh, random trees. Uh, so, I will just start by a comment, and um, uh, but what are the sources of so if we restrict ourselves to mu rho, so the, the average one, what are the possible sources for atoms? Okay, so we have seen that uh, if, for example, if you have a finite graph, so let's think about this. Thing. If you have a finite graph, uh, this measure will be purely atomic. If uh, we have, s have mentioned the, this uh, example from group theory, for example, on the Lamplighter group, 
where uh, this measure can be purely uh, purely uh, atomic also. So, but there is a, another. There is a very uh, simple way to create atoms on infinite graphs. I think it was which was first observed by uh, Kirkpatrick and Egg Carter. In Uh, which is the following. Imagine that your graph, you are interested by the spectral measure at uh, the root, and your graph looks like that. You have a vertex uh, x, you have a vertex y. Here you have the rest of your graph, which could be possibly infinite. Okay? And here you have a finite graph, and here you have a finite graph. Okay, I call that uh, g1 and this G2, okay? Imagine that somewhere in your graph you have this configuration. <coughs> uh, so imagine that G1 is isomorphic to G2. Okay, these two graphs have the same, so in particular they have the same uh, eigenvalues. So they are finite graphs, so take Psi, imagine that you take a G1 of Psi, which is lambda of Psi, and that Psi of uh, zero is not zero. Okay, so then minus psi is also an eigenvector of G two uh, with the same eigenvalue, right? So now consider the vector uh, phi, where you put uh, I don't know, minus one over square root two here, you put psi over square root two here, and everywhere here you put zero. Then the eigenvalue equation is satisfied here because here there is zero. It's satisfied there because here there is zero. And here it's satisfied because every everything here is zero and you have a minus psi of zero, minus plus sign of, uh, plus psi of y, which is uh, there of, of, of reverse order. Okay? So in particular, when every time that you have such uh, configuration, and if, if you imagine that psi is normalized, we found that the mu e naught of g at lambda <coughs> will be larger than the modulus of psi of square divided by two. Okay, because this is an orthogonal projection on, on uh, eigen lambda eigenvectors, you have found one, so it's a, it's a lower bound. So every time that you have a finite pending subgraphs in your uh, in a, in possibly in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an infinite graph will have atoms everywhere on the, in the spectral measure. Okay, for example, I think the motivation of Kirkpatrick and Egerter was, uh, uh, for example, they looked at the percolation on ZD with parameter P and P larger than PC. Okay, if you just restrict, if you just look at the, at the spectrum of the adjacency operator, then with probability one, there exist a unique uh, infinite connecting component. And on this infinite connected component, you can prove that the atomic part is dense because you have finite pending graphs everywhere. Okay. Of course, due to this is just one possibility. G1 and G2 may not be isomorphic, but what is important is that they have a common eigenvector. Okay. So, but that's not the only source of... Uh, <coughs> of troubles and atoms, uh, as uh, Justin will tell you this afternoon. What I want to do is uh, to, uh, <coughs> to not to try to compute atoms, but to try to bound the size of atoms to prove existence of continuous part or absolutely continuous part. So either on the average uh, spectral measure, which is easier, or on the uh, random measure mu g of E0. Okay. So, uh, so up to this point. Uh, uh, so what uh, we have a result with uh, Arnab Sen and uh, Balin Firak, which says the following. So. If you do bound percolation, or you, you do PC depends on D, 
if you take a PC, if you do bound percolation on um, Z2, so which is one half by the one of case 10, uh, and you look at the percolation cluster, so maybe I should write <coughs> rho, which, uh, okay, I will write that. Also. So this measure, uh, it's a, so this is a perc of ZD uh, P, uh, so here it will be a 2. This is a law of the connected component. You, you, you do the percolation on uh, ZD with parameter P, and you look at the connected component of uh, the origin, rotate at the origin. OK, that's what we saw yesterday as an example. So this is a unimodular measure, and we are interested by this, uh, uh, by, by, by this measure. And uh, what we have is that this measure has a uh, non-trivial uh, continuous part. Uh, so I will sketch the proof of that. And um, uh, we will see that we get a lower bound on, uh, on the total mass of the continuous part. Of course, for p less or equal than pc of half, this measure is purely atomic. And for, uh, uh, so this is for percolation cluster. And for trees, we have a more refined result. And uh, I've just taken one result, is that if rho uh, is, is unimodular and supported on trees, OK. Uh, oh, I should say rooted trees, but uh, OK. Uh, then mu rho as non-trivial continuous part um, uh, if, uh, let's say, uh, rho, which would be the law of some rooted tree, okay? If T has uh, two or more ends with positive probability. Where well, an end of a tree is simply a uh, uh, array, so uh, semi-infinite uh, uh, geodesic. Okay? So in fact, a unimodular tree may have two or one, zero, one, two, or an infinite number of ends. But, uh, OK. And we have a more precise result. We can bound here individually the size of each atoms. But uh, I will not enter into that. So I will focus on this. And the, the, the punch to the proof of the, of the, two, the two statements, they rely on a, a quantitative observation that as soon as uh, you have on planar graphs and trees, at least, uh, as soon as you have a long pass, which almost covered your graph, you must have some continuous part. Okay. Long pass on planar graphs. Uh, Create atomic part, uh, continuous part, continuous. Uh. Okay, that's the philosophy of these two results. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, I will try to uh, explain you uh, the first result on percolation on Z2. Uh, so we introduce something uh, which is called the pass matching. So what is that? So you have a G, a finite graph. Um, OK, and you have two subsets, ij in the, of vertices, which have the same cardinal, liti. 
let's call it B. And uh, capital pi, which is a collection of paths, uh, is a pass matching <coughs> if uh, what? If pi i, so it's a sequence of vertices and uh, pi i, so it's a sequence of vertices, I don't know, pi i1, uh, no, maybe uh, pi i k1, pi i k p and i, where which starts, so these are vertices of the graph, and this is a path, so all, all subsequent uh, couple form an edge of the graph. And uh, pi of k1, which starts at uh, y, uh, so let's call, so sorry, my notations are very bad. Let's put an L here. Uh, k, L1, okay. Okay, let's, I don't want to, uh, to overwhelm you with notation. So, pi i l is a pass from uh, i l to j of sigma l, where s and uh, sigma is a permutation of b, which we call the, the matching map. Okay, so you have some points this is a set i, this is a set j, your graph is uh, somewhere, and pi i, uh, i1 is matched to, is there is a pass pi at 1, which goes from i1 to j of sigma 1, there is a pass i2, and so on. And as I, as I draw on, my, on, on the slide, I want that the pi, the, the pass are vertex disjoint. So pi i's are vertex disjoint. Okay. So pass matching is such collection of paths which are vertex disjoint and f which go from a starting set i to an ending set j. And then um, uh, the length of pi is simply the sum of the length of the pass. Okay. Sum of lengths of the pi. Okay, and uh, we say that the pass matching is minimal. Pi is minimal if the, its length is minimal uh, for any pi prime, which is a pass matching. Let's call that P M, uh, which is pass matching uh, from i to j. It could be with a different uh, matching map, sigma, but I want to that among all paths uh, from i to j, uh, from capital I to capital J, uh, the, its length will, uh, will should be minimized to be a minimal pass matching. Okay. Vertex disjoint in each path <coughs> is uh, not with. Ah, so it's vertex, each path is a vertex disjoint and also pi i the intersection of is empty for i different from j. It's like in the picture. I don't want crossings. <coughs> okay, so you see existence of uh, pass matching uh, is some kind of, as I wrote, long pass. Okay, you will see where planar it is important. Not important, but uh, okay. Uh, so the th we have a theorem which uh, uh, generalizes uh, some uh, work of King and Shader on trees, uh, which our theorem says the following: uh, uh, So G is finite. Assume let i and j as above 
and assume that there exist a uni uh, no, there exist uh, pass matchings. Oh, like I said there exist pass matchings from i to j, from i to j, and that all minimal, all pass matching of minimal lengths, uh, which I call minimal pass matching. Uh, have the same uh, matching map. For example, there is a unique pass matching of minimal lengths. Yes? Can you remind us what S index B means? Sigma. Ah, it's a permutation on the first B integers. Yes. Uh, okay. So imagine that you are in such a good position. Then, uh, if m1, if the m1 up to you know, mr are the multiplicities, are the multiplicities of the eigenvalues. Uh, we have that the sum of the mi minus b, so b is a cardinal, the common cardinality of i and j, plus is bounded by uh, uh, l, where l is, uh, let's assume that g, uh, the cardinality of v is n, where L is N minus the minimal pass matching. So it's a number of leftover vertices. It's a number of vertices which are not covered by pass matching of minimal lengths. Okay, so in particular for any K, if you sum the first K uh, multiplicities, it's bounded by K P <coughs> plus L. Okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, this by increasing eigenvalues? If you want. I mean, you see the, the, the position of the eigenvalues, it's a very rough result because the position of the eigenvalues is completely irrelevant. We can do finer uh, estimates which depend on the position of the eigenvalues, but only for tr trees. Uh, okay, so uh, let's ask, let, for example, let's just to understand what these uh, definitions are about. Imagine that you have, uh, and let's prove this theorem on percolation on ZD. Imagine that we do some kind of vertical percolation. So we have the grid of size n, and you remove, you, you just remove some uh, vertical uh, edges. Okay? Then uh, you can build a pass matching. You, if you take i as being this set, okay, and j as being this set, okay, so you have, since it's a planar graph, you have pass matching from i to j, and that's where planarity comes into play. It's uh, there are there is a unique pass matching from i to j. Either there is zero or one. Because otherwise, uh, the edge has to cross. The, the, the vertices uh, should cross. <coughs> okay, so in particular, since you can apply, so this will form a pass matching. So the number of leftover vertices is zero. All vertices are covered. So if you apply this result, it tells you that the multiplicity of any eigenvalue is bounded by, and so b is equal to n, is bounded by n which is very small compared to n squared, which is the total number of vertices. So whatever the, oh, whatever the way you remove the edges, the vertical edges, the multiplicity of each eigenvalue is quite low. But OK, so it's not exactly uh, percolation on ZD, on Z2, but uh, quite close, close enough. So you can refine this argument and prove the result above there. Let's try to do that. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, let's try with the sketch. Let's try to do uh, that. Uh, so, what happens? So you now I take my my reel. So you remember this Luke approximation, uh, which says that instead here instead of so this is a z we look at we are interested by the law of the on the percolation on z two, uh, which is infinite. But you, you, we know that the, the the mass of atoms converge by Luke approximation. We saw that yesterday. So it's enough to, to restrict ourselves to finite box and let n goes to infinity because we know that the mass of each atom converge. Okay, so here is my... Uh, uh, so here I have, there are my bonds. They are present or absent with probability p and 1 minus p. Okay, and so on. Uh, I want to mimic this argument, so I will tell, I will take I, I will take the maximal flow from left to right. Okay, so I will take I as being the maximum number of, uh, I will take B, sorry, as being the maximum number of this joint pass, uh, which are crossing from left to right. So here is one such pass, another one, another one, and so on. And I take B as being the max maximum number of those. Now I take I1 to be this point, I2 to be this point, up to IB, G1, G2, GB. Okay? I can apply my, my theorem, say that if you sum the multiplicity of, for example, the k largest multiplicities, it will be bounded by uh, k. Uh, so b is less than n, of course. So it will be bounded by k times n, okay, plus the number of leftover vertices. Each pass is of length, if each uh, orange pass is of length at least n. Okay? So the number of leftover vertices is upper bounded by n squared, the total number of vertices, minus b times n. Okay? This is an upper bound for L, because my, my pass, each orange pass is at least of length n. So in particular, if b, if you can prove that b is larger than delta times n for some delta positive with high probability, okay, then uh, you will find you divide everything by n squared. It's bounded by k over n which goes to zero in the limit n goes to infinity, plus one minus, uh, b is at least delta n, so one minus delta n, which implies by Luke approximation that the total mass of atoms, uh, for example, the, 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 continuous, the total mass of the continuous part is at least uh, delta. Okay, so in fact, the, tot the, the continuous part has a total mass which is lower bounded by the maximal number of paths, of, by the maximal flow from left to right. And you see, we were able to use uh, our theorem uh, because we the graph is planar, so that could be, if you find such paths, they are unique. So they will all have the same matching path. Okay, so, but then, uh, the question of what is the maximal flow uh, from left to right. Okay, so by Menger's theorem, 
uh, b is equal to mean flow is max cut, so this is a maximal vertex cut uh, from uh, top to bottom. So which is a minimal number. You want to go from bottom to top, and you want to cross the minimal number of vertices which are in the percolation cluster. So here, sometimes, you cross uh, edges which are covered by the... OK. So there is at least uh, 1 over 4. Uh, every vertex is adjacent to 4 vertices, 4 edges, uh, mean cut. Uh, mean, sorry, mean cut. So it's a minimum edge cut OK, I write edge cut because it's easier. Because if you zoom, if you look in the dual graph, so this is uh, the, my box. You look in the dual graph. Here, OK? And then what you do is you put, if this edge is present in the percolation cluster, OK, uh, this edge here will receive a weight, which is 1. OK? If this edge is not present, uh, OK, you see, this is the edge. This edge, if this edge is not present in the percolation cluster, this edge will receive a weight, which is 0. So every edge in the dual graph receives a weight, which is 0 or 1. Depending on that, it crosses an occupied uh, edge. And then the mean, the edge cut, so let's call that t. t is a minimum of the sum of the weights where you take the minimum of all paths, so the edge R and gamma, uh, all paths from uh, top to bottom. So it's a, f it's a first passage percolation problem. And um, so Kestel proved that Tn over n, so in probability, so this is Kestel, 86, in probability, Tn over n converge to delta, OK? And delta positive is equivalent to the probability that the weight, so the weight are ID, that the weight is 0, is uh, less than the, criti that the, critical per that the critical percolation probability in the dual graph, which is 1 half here. OK? But the probability that the weight is 0 is 1 minus p. So for us, it proves that delta is positive. OK, maybe it was too fast, but the idea is just that since you are in a super critical, uh, in a supercritical cluster, percolation cluster, you can pack many yellow paths from left to right. And a dense, so there is a, a, there is a density on the number of paths from left to right. <coughs> so the number of paths b is of order n. And uh, that's it. So in particular, our theorem implies uh, the Kesten theorem of which says that the percolation probability is uh, there exists a unique infinite, there exists an infinite cluster when p is larger than one half. But we use uh, another theorem of Kesten to prove that. So. OK, so let's see. I will try to give you uh, some so the proof of that, because I think it's fun. So So 
So it's an open problem to prove the same statement for d equal to 3. And the obstruction is not the fact that um, first passage is not the problem of uh, the result of case 10 uh, in first passage percolation are uh, valid in all dimensions. Uh, the problem is that uh, our theorem doesn't, the, the problem is on the condition that there exists a unique, that all minimal pass matching has the same matching map. This condition has no reason to be satisfied uh, in dimension higher than uh, 3. Okay, so we should prove this theorem. So, so the so proof over there. So it is based on the divisibility property of the characteristic polynomial. Of the debt of A of A minus X. Okay, so but on the DVD property of a collection of monic polynomials, which will be this uh, characteristic polynomial, but where we restrict ourselves to minors. Okay, so this is the determinant. Uh, so this is a minor where rows in I and columns. in J have been removed. So I'm not sure it's conventional notation. But so what I note here is a number of, is a, in, is, a, is a rows and columns which I remove in the estimation of this determinant. Okay? So you introduce the delta B, B sorry, of A minus X as being the, um, so it's a, it's a monic polynomial, which would be, so maybe it's, uh, okay. the, it will be the greatest common divisor of, so let's call that, uh, well, we don't need a name for that, of that of A minus X IJ over all J, so that the cardinal of I is equal to cardinal of J, which is B. Okay, so, and zero divides is, divisib is div divisible by any polynomial. Okay. So, for example, if i is equal to j, the determinant of a minus x, i i, as a degree. Um, n minus i, which is n minus b. Okay, so n will be the total number of vertices. Right? Because this will be, this in this case, this is simply the Cartes polynomial of, uh, of an Hermitian matrix of size uh, n minus b. Okay. And uh, so in particular, the degree of uh, delta B is at most N minus B. So we want to prove that the, in fact this degree in situations which are described like that, they are uh, much lower. Uh, so, and another thing is that we can relate easily the degree of, of this uh, greatest common divisor. In fact, it's exactly the sum of M I minus B plus. So the first fact is <coughs> Why is it true? So if, let's check this fact. If, if, A, if A is diagonal, okay? So you have lambda 1, m1 times, lambda 2, m2 times, and so on. Okay? When you take the determinant of A minus x i 
i, and you take, for example, the i where you try to remo you remove b, you try to remove at most uh, values at the columns of, uh, you try to, you remove uh, b, at, uh, the maximum between b and m1, uh, rows and columns on, on lambda 1. You will get that delta b div is divides a polynomial where the lambda 1 has a root with multiplicity m1 minus b plus. You can do that for any eigenvalue, and you get this statement. Okay? And I mean, uh, because otherwise it's zero. If you take a of ij with i different from j, then since it's a di since there are zeros here, you will have uh, the determinant will be simply zero. So the degree, so delta b is the product of the lambda i minus x power m i minus b plus over i. So this is true if a is diagonal. But in fact, it's true as soon as a is uh, uh, any Hermitian matrix. It's not, it's not difficult, but. The only observation is that uh, the only observation is that uh, the determinant, the delta b, if you compose by, uh, you could define b b of x as being any uh, any n by n matrix with uh, polynomial coefficients, delta b of b of x is equal to delta b of u b of x v if u and v are invertible matrices. Okay, so this would be fact two. Okay, so if you know the fact two, it implies the fact one because uh, you know that a minus x is uh, d minus x times uh, u u star for some unitary matrix. And uh, we have already computed delta of v for a diagonal matrix. So the fact two, uh, it's just an exercise on the linearity of the determinant, which says that, for example, if b1, bn are the rows of the columns <coughs> of uh, b of x, and you look at the determinant of a linear combination, for example, of the first row, We would like to prove that the delta b of b divides this guy. Okay? Because then using, if you prove that, you, it will prove, uh, you can put, okay, by linearity, and uh, you can do the same on the rows and columns, and it will imply that. Uh, so you want to prove that whether or not delta b of b of x divides that. Where i j of cardinal b, cardinality b. So you use the linearity of the determinant. This is the sum of the a i of the depth of b i. So maybe it's columns of so j, b j, b two, b n. Okay, there are a few cases to consider. Okay, if one is in J, meaning that you have removed, in this expression, you have removed, uh, you have removed the, the first column, uh, the value here is irrelevant. So we can assume that, that's of generality, that one is not in J. Otherwise, there is nothing to prove. If Y is not in J, and J, imagine that J is uh, not in J neither then it means that b of j, somewhere there is b of j, because j is not in j, so we, we, there is a determinant and two columns are equal, so it's zero. Okay? So again, there is nothing to prove. So we can assume that the only case to consider is one not in j and j in j. 
But then uh, you just switch, you put BJ on the J play position, and uh, it, it, will take you, uh, it will give you a minus, but it will still be one of the minor of your X. Okay. So this proves uh, that. Oh, Charles, I'm just missing some scaling here. So is there some assumption that determinant of U times V is 1? Determinant of? U times V. So what? Ah, so U and V should be invertible. Otherwise, what we prove is that the determinant of B of X divides that. Yeah, invertible, but, but what about the constant? So there are matrices, is there some determinant one? Ah, OK, so uh, you have to define, uh, yes. So you have to define the fact you, the, the, common divisor, the greatest common divisor has to be a, a monic polynomial. So then you don't have to care about what you are. Otherwise, of course, you should have the product of determinant equal to one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, so we want to, to are back to our problem. So now the goal. So the only thing to prove is to, to take the determinant of A minus X of I, J, where I and J are exactly my pass matching. And uh, we should prove that the degree of that is uh, uh, L. So that would be the fact is three. Because, because you know that this is less due to the definition of the greatest common divisor. Its degree is less than any other. Uh, non-zero polynomials that it divides, so it will be less than the sum of but the degree of delta B of A minus X, which is, as we saw, the sum of the Mi minus B plus. Okay. So now uh, it's simply uh, a determinant expansion. There is, I will stop very soon because it's uh, so what we did is just to write this determinant. So it's just, uh, there is nothing fancy here. You, you can write it, we found convenient to write it as a, as a determinant of uh, another matrix B minus XD of size N times N, because it's easier, where B, where D, I, I, uh, D, I, I is one uh, minus the indicator that i is in i unit j, and b is like that. So if b is the same as a, except that when you have a vertex in, if when you consider a vertex in i l, in a vertex in i, you just put outgoing edges, and when you take uh, consider a vertex in j, you just consider ingoing edges, and you add an extra vertex, an extra edge like that. So B of E I is equal to sum of uh, B of E J is equal to sum of uh, what J different from I of A I J E I, uh, sorry. Okay, this is to say that you consider only outgoing edges and B of E, G, L is E, I, L. Okay, so you want to, so what you do is you write that as a sum of over all permutation of the signature of the permutation of the product of uh, B, I, sigma, uh, to I minus X, D, I, to I. Okay, and for this product to be non-zero, let me do one last picture. <laughs> oh, 
all the rest is um, for this product to be non-zero, i has to be matched to one of its neighbors. And then uh, this guy has to be matched to somewhere along a path up to it reach an element in j. Then j is the only way to consider is to come back to i2 because all, the, all other entries are zero, and then like that. Okay, so what you you do some uh, really ba uh, basic computation, and what you will find is that this will be equal to the sum of all pass matchings of some sign, which you can compute, but uh, of the determinant of a minus x pi pi. Okay, because when you have removed the pass matching. The complement, it's simply uh, B and this matrix B minus X and, and A minus X coincide. So this has degree exactly N minus L. So the only thing that you have to, ch L, sorry. So the only, for minimal, the only thing that you have to, to check is that the sum of the plus minus does not cancel. That's the reason of the. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the ID. Let's see. Uh, okay, so I will not. We have another uh, way to for trees. I will not mention. Uh, we have an analog criterion which I will not mention because I don't have enough time. But uh, let's see. just give you a consequence of so we don't as you see the proof is based on determinants and so we don't have a direct analog of this theorem for on, on an infinite graph uh, for the other criterion which I will just not mention we have we apply it it's a criterion which works directly on infinite graphs on, on unimodular uh, rooted tree. So what uh, the uh, theorem that we have is that you define an invariant line ensemble as a pair formed by, so you take rho supported on trees, okay, rho unimodular. So this will be the law of some graph, some tree, rooted tree. And uh, imagine that on an enlarged uh, probability space, so there are the, these are my, there is a tree. You can, you can build, uh, inf you can build lines which go from one hand to another of the tree, uh, in such a way that the, the, the lines and the tree is still unimodular. So the way you can encode, uh, you can see that as a weighted graph. Uh, so there are some lines, there are some other vertices which are not covered by the lines, edges which are not covered by the lines. If that you can see, uh, uh, the you can align, is simply, um, uh, it's simply a weighted, uh, you can put weights on edges and say that the weight of an edge of the form UV uh, is between uh, zero, is zero or one, and the constraint is that the sum of L of U V belongs to is either zero or two, where you sum over a U, and this should be true for any V. Okay, so any vertex is either crossed by the line, in which case it has two distinguished edges, or not, and it's zero. Okay, so you can of course build uh, this. Uh, Local weak topology and unimodularity it extends to weighted graphs, and we say that we have an invariant line ensemble if you can build uh, such uh, such weights on the edges such that uh, the the weighted tree is still unimodular. And then what we have is that so these are the this is what um, so your tree is tr is uh, can be uh, covered partly by infinite lines. Then what we have is that the continuous part of uh, 
So total mass of the continuous part is at least the probability under the measure that rho is covered by the path. Where you say that uh, if the sum is 2, you say that uh, the vertex in, is in the, on the line. <coughs> OK. So then you, you can try to find an example on which kind of trees can you be able, are you able to build in such infinite line ensemble. And for example, you can prove that this is always, there will always <coughs> exist an infinite li line ensemble there exists an invariant line ensemble uh, such that the probability that the root is in L is at least one six of uh, the degree of x minus the degree of the root minus two plus divided by what? I don't know. The divided by the expectation of the degree, something like that. We will see in exercise that the fact that you have two or more ends, is when you are supported on infinite trees, is equivalent to the, to the say that the expectation of the degree is at least is larger than two. OK, so as soon as you have a graph which has two or more ends, this is positive. And you will have, uh, some, you will have some invariant line ensemble of a positive density. So you will have continuous part. So I skip many details here, of course, but uh, we have something which is slightly stronger because we can bound individual mass of atoms, but I will not enter into those details. Uh, so the open problems in this part, so is uh, some criterion for uh, absolutely existence of absolutely continuous part. In the, spectra, in the average spectral measure. You, you have seen that for uh, Schrodinger operators, you, you have this uh, um, Wegener estimate, which gives you exactly that. But here, everything is discrete, so it's a tough question. And we have no criterion for absolutely continuous part, just criteria which bounds the total mass of atoms. Uh, we have spent some energy to try to do uh, critical percolation in dimension larger than three, at least uh, three or more. And there are some other models where we don't know, like uh, um, trees with one end, uh, random, uh, the limit, the uniform planar maps, for example. which are objects which are critical in some sense, where we can uh, not apply in, in either of our, of our model. So we don't know whether or not the, the corresponding spectral measure has some continuous part or not. OK, now I want to go uh, to simplify, to look in a very simple setting, to try to be able to say something about the non-average measure. This is much harder. So for example, a toy problem. So I think this kind of problem was called quantum percolation by uh, a paper by Degen and Lafort and Mio in the 50s shortly after the paper of Anderson. So, mm, well, it's a fancy name, but whatever. So what, um, I don't know really what it means, but so what uh, concretely what we'll be speak about is, for example, you imagine a Galton, you take a Galton Watson tree, which 
with offspring distribution P. Okay, so the root has uh, a number n of offspring which is sampled according to P and all other all its offsprings have a uh, number of offsprings samples independently, which have an independent samples with, again, distribution P and so on. Okay, so we could try to understand the adjacency operator here and try to understand uh, this measure. Try to decompose it as a continuous plus uh, pure point plus singular continuous part. Uh, okay, it's not a unimodular uh, tree except when P is Poisson, but uh, there is a unimodular version of it, and which I will not. Right. There is no... If you prefer unimodular, you can ask. You can, if you know what it is, you can just consider a unimodular cotton water tree with degree distribution P. And what I'm going to say is correct. Uh, so uh, so we, understand, we want to understand this measure. Uh, so it's a very hard question. Uh, me, my personal interest was to take P as Poisson because it is, uh, this is a local weekly, this is a Benjamin Ishram limit of uh, an Erdos-René graph and try to s prove that for C large enough, this measure has a continuous part because we know that for C, for any C, uh, on the expected spectral measure has uh, atoms, dense atoms everywhere. So every totally real algebraic integer is an atom as uh, Justin will probably explain you. So, but still, uh, there could be, even if this measure has uh, atoms everywhere, there could still be some hope that there are some continuous parts which emerge at some quantum per percolation threshold. Okay? And uh, some physicists uh, very close to here, uh, Bauer and Golinelli, uh, they have even a conjecture on what is this quantum percolation threshold. But, uh, okay. So, uh, back to her, so uh, uh, unfortunately I'm not able to say anything about that. So I will do something uh, simpler, which is I will consider a measure P, which is close to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be constant. So in some, so at the Wasserstein distance, uh, which is the piece power of the expectation of n minus q for some <laughs> deterministic q uh, is small, and p would be larger than one. Okay, so Keller has proved the theorem based on work with uh, Simon, Var Simon and uh, uh, Daniel Lenz. So Keller has proved the theorem which says that if uh, P of zero is zero, and uh, W P of P delta Q is less than some is small enough. Well, small enough depends on P, on small P. Uh, uh, for some P larger than one. then almost surely with respect to the randomness of the tree mu t of e naught is absolutely continuous okay uh, since i was interested by poisson another another case which is interesting is for example when you do bound percolation so you are interested by P, which would, another interesting example, is a binomial, it's a binomial variable with parameter, uh, it's too many P, so sorry, uh, P <laughs> and Q. And Q, uh, Q is a greater than Q? Ah, yes, uh, sorry. Q is an integer greater than Q. So what you do is your tree is close to TQ, which is a Q array, the infinite Q array tree. So every vertex has two, has Q of springs. 
So it's not unimodular because the root has a different degree than the other. But okay, so what I could uh, prove uh, is um, to lift up to, as soon as you lift this condition, from what I've started with, there are finite pending sum graphs everywhere in the tree. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it implies that the atomic part of, uh, you will find atom possibly atoms, a dense set of atoms on the support of this measure. But it still, there could still be some continuous part. So that's what I did. Uh, <coughs> So this is not Keller anymore. So let's uh, we say that if W P of delta Q uh, is small enough, oh, it's not the same epsilon net for some P at least one, uh, then mu E naught T has uh, an absolutely a non-trivial absolutely continuous part with positive probability. Because with positive probability, your tree is finite. So it's just atomic. Okay, and moreover, you can have something like... Uh, um, uh, you can be more precise than that. And say Not that... What? Not just continuous, but even absolutely. Absolutely continuous. But so this measure has uh, atoms everywhere, but still some. And you can prove that the at if the density is uh, if f of lambda is uh, density of uh, mu t of e naught of the absolutely continuous part of that, uh, you can prove that and f. SC of lambda is the uh, density of the semicircular law with radius square root Q, uh, two square root Q. So it's something like uh, working in random matrices, but not knowing the <laughs> normalizing factor. A bit ashamed, but okay. So it's uh, uh, lambda squared, uh, sorry. <laughs> so it's two Q minus lambda squared indicator that modulus of lambda is less than to uh, 4Q. Okay, so uh, you can prove that uh, the, the expectation of f of lambda minus f of lambda c goes to zero as uh, W1 of P delta Q goes to zero. Okay, so it implies that this absolutely continuous part uh, it has a total mass which goes to one as uh, you get closer to the infinite Curie Q R E three, and its density approximate in uh, 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 its density uh, approximates the semicircular law. If you are speaking about the unimodular Galton Watson tree, you will get instead of the semicircular law the Kesten Mackey law. Which we saw yesterday. Yes. That's a result of the way you drop the P of zero is equal to zero condition. Ah, yeah. It's, so it's there is no. So this is. So there. Are, so. So there is not the P equal to zero condition. Okay. The second statement is to compare with the binary or with the delta Q. The second what? The second statement. The W P P. Yes. W P of P delta Q is small enough. Yes, maybe just put uh, one here. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So if in L one, if in L one, the distance, you are close enough to a direct mass at Q. So it's just that the expectation of uh, n minus Q is small enough. Then you will have some absolutely continuous part with positive probability. So. Uh, so in fact, what this theorem is about. What I just did is uh, I did some pre-processing on this, on this uh, random tree and uh, applied some result of, uh, for example, Simon and uh, Michael uh, on random Schrodinger operator. So what I want to explain you is how 
uh, you can connect uh, this quantum percolation problem to some problem on uh, uh, random Schrodinger operator on trees, which are more or less well understood. Okay. Well, uh, I don't call it per it's a Degen. There is a paper by Degen, Mio, and Lafor. The physicists call everything quantum perturbation. If you want, want to study the adjacency operator on all kinds of perturbation yeah. graphs. Yeah, OK. That, that is just quantum perturbation. Yeah, I mean, the tree <laughs> is uh, it's quantum perturbation on trees, if you want. For, for studying the adjacency operator on a population <coughs> graph, that is called quantum population because quantum is always I mean, the adjacency operator is, is the kinetic energy of a quantum particle, uh, and it's now in a random environment. But it's simpler when we call it that way. I should be shown. Yes. So, so uh, okay. So. We understand this result as a perturbation of the QRE tree. Yes. Uh, the spectrum and the, the spectral measure of the QRE tree is the Kessel Mac. No, it's a semicircular. Because it's not the the for the Kessel Mac is for is would be for regular tree. Okay. So since we have a bias at the at the root, you get the semicircular. Okay. But as I said, uh, if you can modify this statement and put Kessel Mac if you replace at the beginning by okay. unimodular Galton ensemble. OK, so what I want to explain you is briefly how you transfer this problem, where, which apparently is very tough because you have uh, atoms everywhere, to a more well understood problem of uh, uh, random Schrodinger operators on trees. OK, so uh, let me, uh, what is, what did I say? OK, so. I guess the first, pro so let's consider the, the, the Anderson operator of uh, in Simon course, okay? Oh, you like to put a minus here. Uh, so, uh, proofs of, so you can, s when you are on the infinite QRE tree, when lambda is zero, your spectral measure at the root is simply the semicircular law with this uh, radius. Uh, uh, two square root q. Okay, so, and uh, if you call g of z the Cauchy's this transform of uh, uh, the semicircular law, what happens is that it satisfies a fixed point equation, which is uh, z plus long, uh, z plus some. Q times G of Z, but I write it like that. Okay, so now if you consider the adjacency operator of this uh, uh, exactly as uh, in this fin Finberg formula that we saw yesterday, if you look at the, ad if you take G not of Z, which would be defined as uh, like that. Of, uh, it's a Q times G. <laughs> I just write it like that. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, and this fixed point characterizes the semicircular law. Uh, G satisfied due to the recursive structure of, uh, uh, of the QRE tree. G will satisfy a fixed point equation, but G naught has the same distribution. That minus z minus lambda v not uh, plus sum of y to q of g so x maybe of g x uh, okay minus one everything depends on z here and the g x are id copies of g not. is a simple consequence of the resolvent formula. And then um, uh, the, the resolvent is bounded 
by 1 over the imaginary part of z. So then it's easy to, to see that uh, when uh, lambda for any z with imaginary part uh, which is positive, g naught of z will converge uh, in probability to g of z because as lambda goes to zero. Okay, because this term becomes negligible and you arrive exactly at the same fixed point. So, so let me rewrite it like that. Okay? But of course, the, what is, uh, the, the main difficulty is to get this convergence uniform in the, on the imaginary part of Z. Uh, At least for some, uh, when the real part of Z is some in Z in some uh, uh, spectral region. And uh, so the first one to achieve that was Klein, I think, still in 1996. Okay, where well, he transposed this equation, he wrote, he wrote uh, for example, the the Fourier transform of the, the he wrote the, he wrote this equation in terms of uh, of um, uh, Fourier transform of the laws at the fixed point and apply some abstract uh, implicit function theorem saying that the fixed point was locally stable when you are perturbing what went over around the cube fixed and lambda going to zero. Then there were more refined methods. I mean, it's a beautiful method. Then there was uh, an approach by Asler and Spitzler. Which was further extended by uh, Keller, Lenz and uh, Varsen. Okay, which is more geometric, but it which quantifies uh, in some sense quantifies uh, the fact that this equation is looks like uh, a contraction uh, locally when Q is larger than 2. And uh, there is another proof which gives a weaker statement but uh, which is very neat by Eisenman, Sims and Varzel in 2006. Okay, but the idea is still the same, but and so you have to prove that uh, this map has some contraction property which allows you to take this conversion uniform in the imaginary part of Z. So one, one important point is that on random Schrodinger operators, ah, so for, for in my case, we have G naught of Z, which is minus Z plus the sum over all of spring of the root. So just n, say, <laughs> of g of x of z. We are condition on n, g, x are id copies of g naught. So we have replaced uh, the randomness on the potential by a randomness in this sum. Okay. That's <laughs> well, it can be an almost true if you define that properly. Okay. So... Uh, what I want to do quickly is to explain you how you can move, write this equation in terms of uh, like something which looks roughly like that and where you can, uh, if you read one of those papers, you will be able to apply one of those methods to uh, this, uh, this problem. Okay, uh, so it's based on a three decomposition, so which is very simple. So you look at the probability. You look at t, you have your infinite tree, you have your tree. Okay, tx is this tree. Well, it's a subtree rooted at x uh, of all vertices which uh, was passed to the root and goes through x. Okay. And you look at s, the set, the survival set, the set of x such that t of x is infinite. Okay? And t e, the probability of extinction, 
the probability that the root is not in S. Okay, so PE is the smallest root of, uh, as you all know, uh, of X is phi X, where phi is a generating function of, uh, of the of spring distribution. Okay, we are in a setting where PE, the probability of, of extinction, goes to zero when W P of delta Q goes to zero. The closer you get to uh, the probability of extinction is continuous for the local topology, for the weak topology, sorry, uh, at any point except the direct mass at one. Okay, so now what you do is uh, you write this equation in terms of whether or not so of course you have to condition on the fact that the root is in uh, its subtree is infinite okay because otherwise oh, maybe I should not erase that so what you do you you have Ne and S, so Ne plus Ns is equal to total, the total number of vertices of the root, offspring of the root, are the number of vertices which get extinct, and Ns the number of vertices which, which survive infinitely. Okay, of course you can compute the joint law of those two guys, that's quite easy, and uh, it's uh, an exercise in probability, and uh, the only thing that uh, we will use, so you could write uh, condition on ns larger than 1, it's the same thing as conditioning on the fact that the, the tree, uh, the root as an, the, the, the tree is infinite. Okay? You can compute these joint laws. Okay? And so you, we, we denote by G0s of z the law, the conditional law. So you have G0s of z, which would be equal to minus z plus the sum from x to n prime s, where n prime s is uh, uh, yeah. so condition g is the conditional law, and n prime e n prime s is a conditional law of uh, the number of, of vertices which get extinct and survived in the condition on the fact that there is at least one which survives. So then, if you survive, you have an IID copy of the, of, of the variable, of the resolvent when you survive, plus something which I put in a noise, but now the noise depends on V, a potential, where V of Z is the sum of N prime E of G, X, E, Z. Okay, where well, again, G, X, E, Z, uh, is a law of, uh, as low, the law of uh, the resolvent at the root when condition on getting extinct. Another fact is that the expectation of n prime e goes to zero as uh, p delta q goes to zero. Okay, so you are almost here, but the problem is that your potential depends on Z, and that's where you have atoms everywhere, okay? Okay, but there is a lemma. which says that for any epsilon, there exists a K, a subset of R, which is not uh, compact, but okay. Right. K, maybe not a good notation, such that the Lebesgue measure of the complement is bounded by epsilon. And the expectation of the, su uh, sorry, the supremum 
of the, exp of the expectation of the absolute value of V of lambda plus I eta power P. So let P larger than 1. The expectation of this, where lambda go is in K and eta uh, is positive, that this goes to 0 as W P of P delta Q goes to 0. Okay, so up to removing a, su a nasty subset of, of uh, real numbers, which will be dense, because that's, that's where exactly what would, what would be the atoms of the measure. You can control the any moment, as soon as you convert on this fast enough, you can control any moment of uh, this rest. And then what you can do is you, you restrict yourself to this deterministic set K, and uh, you apply one of your, the methods of uh, No, because you, 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 when you are, when lambda is in K, you control, you control nothing on the, poten on the noise, on the potential. The potential is bounded in LP yes. only for lambda in your set K. But this set K has an, uh, an empty, uh, is this set K, K complement, the, the complement of K is dense in R. So it's still some. So I think in two minutes, I can almost give you the proof of this lemma. Yeah, almost. <laughs> so the first point is that the probability that the tree a uh, condition on extinction, OK? Condition on extinction, uh, so, so I put the condition of the fact that the tree gets extinct. Your tree, since it's a supercritical tree, either it dies out very fast or it will be infinite. Okay. So it turns out that you can prove that this is less than C times delta power K minus 1 for uh, and delta arbitrarily small. as a p close to uh, delta q. So it means exactly what I said, that condition of non-extinction, you are very likely to die, to, to be not to have offspring. Because delta is very small, so uh, yes. OK? That's the first. Uh, which can be proved. It's an, again an exercise in uh, probability. <laughs> the second point now is we will build this set. We introduce lambda k as being the set of eigenvalues, uh, the set of lambda, so that lambda is in the spectrum of some finite tree t, where t has size k. Less than k, let's say. The number of unlabeled trees grows exponentially. So there are at most any two trees which are isomorphic that will have uh, the same spectrum. And the uh, tree of size k is at most k eigen distinct eigenvalue. So it implies that lambda k is bounded. It does not grow too fast. It's bounded like c to the k for some universal constant c, which you can compute. Uh, not ex well, OK, open the book by Flagelli and Sedgwick, and you will know more about this constant c. C is the number of unlabeled graphs of size k. Now, your set k is very easy. You take just k as being the set. So now is where I should not. Uh, OK, so your set, you take b k of epsilon, which is the set of x in R, which are close to one of the lambda k. And close uh, 
being exponentially close. And then you take k, which, which is r, minus the union of the bk, BK epsilon for over all k. OK, so the Lebesgue measure of k is bounded by the, of k complement, is bounded by the sum of the Lebesgue measure of those guys, is bounded by the sum. You look at balls around lambda k, so the sum over k of, card of lambda k, so you sum over all eigenvalues in lambda k, and then you grow a ball of radius epsilon 2 minus k over lambda k, which is epsilon, if I have my computation correct. So this is an arbitrary, the complement is arbitrary small. And then what you have to check is that the expectation of that is bounded. Ah, I'm two minutes. Do I have two minutes? Okay. Due to this fact, because you can even prove that in uh, LP, if here you put P, what is enough to check What is enough to check is that the, so the potential is a sum of, so this is a small sum in LP, it's usually zero, but uh, it's very, uh, so we have to check that this variable is bounded by some constant, uh, which will depend on delta, uh, for any uniformly for any z in my set k. And then it's, uh, it's a sum of terms like that, and the sum has a small number of terms, you get the answer. So, and so the only thing you use, it's very rough, is that the distance, uh, if you have the cauchy stiles stress transform of some measure, this is bounded by, this is a cauchy stiles stress transform of some measure nu, this is bounded by the one over the distance between uh, the support of nu and uh, z. OK, so you can bound, let's do p equal to 1. You can bound uh, the expectation of g e o z by the sum over all k, the probability that the tree, the extinct, the tree which gets extinct is larger than k. Uh, uh, times, since you are in lambda k, when the tree is less than k, you are in lambda k, so this, this, since you are in k, this will be, you can bound g, you can bound this term, if you know that the subtree is of size at most k, by uh, 1 over the distance, so which is at least the reciprocal of that. Okay, so this is bounded by c power k, and this is bounded by delta power k. So if delta is small enough, this will be a converging theory. That's it. Okay, so thank you. So today there is no. Uh, I, I, I have a I have a question for the part. Um, maybe uh, for the, what I would call one interpolation on the interpolation. Now what you seem to do is in your the result of the result what is proven is the percolation threshold for quantum percolation is actually also what happens to the name. Yes, but for the density of, ta of state, not for the non average measure. Ah, that was the uh -huh. That's yes. why it was easy. I mean, easy. Ah, uh -huh. that is the density of state. Yes. Uh -huh.
So it's just a Wegener estimate. I wouldn't believe this. Uh, I mean, the, the physicists believe in the percolation threshold for quantum percolation is actually higher. And you can intuitively understand why. Because in percolation, there are always bottlenecks. And a quantum particle, I mean, it, it just cannot go, get through these bottlenecks. It will get stuck at the end. It's um, scattering events. So it could be actually strictly higher. OK, on three. Uh, on, on three, it's clear that it's I, I is clear. So there's yeah. no proof, but uh, I'm, yeah, it's I'm, I would bet my uh, my shirt that it's uh, it's uh, higher. On Z on ZD, uh, I would not I would not be that confident. But uh, I, I would also bet my shirt that it's higher. Okay. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, it's yeah. But it's a much much more difficult yeah, question, of course. Thank you.